and the most obviously effective um, civil rights protest was some form of boycott. African Americans had very considerable buying power in the South after, 19, after 1945. Here you are African Americans living in the poorest region in the country in the years before World War II and being the poorest section of that community. Now a lot of that remains, they remain disproportionately poor, disproportionately rural and the rest of it, but they have migrated to the southern cities and the southern economy is transforming itself after 1945. And um, for the first time, African Americans have significant buying power which they can use through the boycott uh, in, in Montgomery in 1955-56. African Americans are going to not ride the buses and the bus company will lose something like three quarters of a million dollars. Um, so that's a powerful lever uh, to be using in the sit-ins. Um, which is probably the dominant form, of some sit-ins in some form or another, prom probably the dominant form of protest in the years between 1960 and 1963. Um, they're again exploiting their buying power. They're, they're arguing that they have a right to be served in institutions which sell them services but won't allow them, for instance, to sit at lunch counters and have uh, meals alongside whites. And uh, uh, that's a, the, the boycott is a very powerful weapon. And Martin Luther King always argued that the historians underestimated the impact of bo economic boycotts. And at Birmingham in 1963, um, the, uh, the, the cause of the civil rights demonstrations were helped enormously by the fact that the Birmingham downtown merchants had lost about 50% of their trade in the, in the m weeks before Easter. Uh, and that made them much more responsive to the demands of the civil rights movement to negotiate in Birmingham. But the, the, the final uh, challenge on the part of the civil rights movement, the final way that the civil rights movement um, operated was that it, that it was trying to create crises in the South um, which would either force the local community to make concessions or would force the federal government to intervene. Um, a boycott in itself um, like the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, doesn't demand any action on the part of whites. If whites want to lose the money, they can simply sit back and allow African Americans to boycott indefinitely. And in Montgomery they did. And if it hadn't been for the Supreme Court handing down the decision outlawing the bus segregation statute in Alabama, um, the, the boycott would not have won. But um, a sit-in puts more pressure on the white community. A sit-in forces the, the white merchant either to, to um, shut the store or to get the sit-in demonstrators arrested um, or to negotiate. Uh, they can't do nothing. And in, and in Montgomery, they, they could do nothing in the boycott, but with a, a sit-in, it puts more pressure on them. Go a step further. These are both methods designed to persuade southern whites to change their behaviour. And what the civil rights movement becomes uh, very successful at after 1961, 60-61, is to say, if Southern whites won't make concessions, how do we force them to make concessions? If we can't shame them into changing their behaviour by the quality of, our, quality of our redemptive suffering, by our non-violence and our Christian example, if we can't shame them into changing their behaviour, how can we exert some pressure on them? And from the Freedom Rides onwards, riding these integrated buses through the south, uh, attempting to integrate the bus terminals uh, in the deep south. Um, or the demonstrations at Albany and Birmingham where they are uh, constant marches and sit-ins and demonstrations. What they're trying to do is to step up the pressure on these deep south communities so that um, the, the, some, something gives.